Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a travel consultant and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon, Dreamtime Travel. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm interested in the holidays you offer along the coast near here. Yes, we operate several tours up the coast. Where in particular did you want to go? Well, I like the sound of the holiday that mentioned whales. Was it、um, whale watching? Oh, that's our whale watch experience. It's very popular, and it's based in a lovely little town with nice beaches. Oh, right. And how long does it last? It's two days. That includes four hours travel time each way from here. Good. I don't want to be away any longer than that. So, is that by coach? Actually, it's by minibus. We like to keep those two as small and personal, so we don't take a whole coach load of people. In fact, we only take up to fifteen people on this tour. Although we do run it with just twelve or thirteen. Oh right. So, do you run these tours often? Well, it depends on the time of year. Of course, in peak times like the summer holidays, we do them every weekend. But at the moment, it's usually once a month at most. And when is the next one going? Hmm. Let me see. Ah,、uh, there's one in three weeks' time, which is April the eighteenth, and then we don't have another one until、uh, June the second. All right. Um. And is April a good time to go? Pretty good, though the really good time is later in the year. I have to say though that the whale sighting is only one of the many things offered. Really? Yes. The hotel itself, where you stay, has great facilities. It's called the Palisades.、Uh, the Paris what? No, it's actually the Palisades. P A L L I S A D E S. It's right on the main beach there. Oh, I see. All of the rooms have nice views, and the food is really good there too. Oh right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. And what about the other things,、um, you know, that are included in the price? Oh, there are lots of things. If you don't want to do the whale watch cruise, your guide will take anyone who is interested either on a bush walk through the national park near the hotel, and there's no extra charge for that, or on a fishing trip. That's an extra twelve dollars, I think. And there's also a reptile park in town that costs more or less the same. No, I think I'd prefer whales to snakes. Yeah, and if you just want to relax, you're free to sit by the hotel pool or go down the beach. Oh, and they also have tennis courts at the hotel, but you have to pay for those by the hour. But there are table tennis tables downstairs, and they are part of the accommodation package. Just speak to your guide. Well, that sounds good.、Um, so, how much is the basic tour price? At this time of year, it's usually around three hundred dollars. But let me check.、Um, oh, it's actually two hundred and eighty dollars. And the next tour? Are there any places on that one? How many people is it for? There are two of us. Yes, that should be fine. Can I just mention that we require all bookings to be made at least fourteen days before you travel to avoid cancellations of tours, and if you cancel within seven days of departure. You will have to pay fifty percent of your total booking. Okay. And you also need to pay a twenty percent deposit at the time of booking. Can I pay that by credit card? Yes, you can. All right.、Uh, what I'll do is I'll talk to my partner and get back to you. Fine. So I'll make a provisional booking, shall I? 
Two for the whale watch experience. Let me issue you with a customer reference number for when you call back. Do you have a pen? Yes. Okay. It's three nine seven four five T. That's T for Tango. When you call back, ask to speak to the tour manager. That's me, Tracy. Fine, I will. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a woman called Annie, who works at the snow centre in New Zealand, welcoming a group of visitors to the centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi everyone, welcome to the Snow Centre. My name's Annie. I hope you enjoyed the bus trip from the airport. We've certainly got plenty of snow today. Well, you've come to New Zealand's premier snow and ski centre and we've a whole load of activities for you during your week here. Most visitors come here for the cross-country skiing, where you're on fairly flat ground for most of the time, rather than going down steep mountainsides. There are marked trails, but you can also leave these and go off on your own, and that's an experience not to be missed. You can go at your own speed. It's great aerobic exercise if you really push yourself. Or, if you prefer, you can just glide gently along and enjoy the beautiful scenery. This afternoon, you'll be going on a dog sled trip. You may have seen our dogs on TV recently, racing in the Winter Sled Festival. If you want, you can have your own team for the afternoon and learn how to drive them, following behind our leader on the trail. Or if you'd prefer, you can just sit back in the sled and enjoy the ride as a passenger. At the weekend, we have the team relay event, and you're all welcome to join in. We have a local school coming along, and a lot of the teachers are taking part too. Participation rather than winning is the main focus, and there's a medal for everyone who takes part. Participants are in teams of two to four, and each team must complete four laps of the course. For your final expedition, you'll head off to Mount Frenna, wearing a pair of special snowshoes which allow you to walk on top of the snow. This is an area where miners once searched for gold, though there are very few traces of their work left now. When the snow melts in summer, the mountain slopes are carpeted in flowers and plants. It's a long ascent, though not too steep, and walkers generally take a couple of days to get to the summit and return. You'll spend the night in our hut halfway up the mountain. 
that's included in your package for the stay. It's got cooking facilities, firewood and water for drinking. For washing, we recommend you use melted snow, though, to conserve supplies. We can take your luggage up on our snowmobile for you for just $10 a person. The hut has cooking facilities, so you can make a hot meal in the evening and morning, but you need to take your own food. The weather on Mount Frenna can be very stormy. In that case, stay in the hut. Generally, the storms don't last long. Don't stress about getting back here to the centre in time to catch the airport bus. They'll probably not be running anyway. We do have an emergency locator beacon in the hut, but only use that if it's a real emergency, like if someone's ill or injured. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, let me tell you something about the different ski trails you can follow during your stay here. Highland Trail's directly accessible from where we are now. This trail's been designed to give first-timers an experience they'll enjoy regardless of their age or skill, but it's also ideal for experts to practice their technique. Then there's Pine Trail. If you're nervous about skiing, leave this one to the experts. You follow a steep valley looking right down on the river below. Scary! But if you've fully mastered the techniques needed for hills, it's great fun. Stony Trail's a good choice once you've got a general idea of the basics. There are one or two tricky sections, but nothing too challenging. There's a shelter halfway where you can sit and take a break and enjoy the afternoon sunshine. And finally, Loser's Trail. This starts off following a gentle river valley, but the last part is quite exposed, so the snow conditions can be challenging. If it's snowing or windy, check with us before you set out to make sure the trail's open that day. Right, so now if you'd like to follow me, we'll get started. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a college professor and two students talking about a course on shooting video projects. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Professor, Professor Edwards. Edwards. What's, happening? What's happening? Well, the department head just told me I've got to teach this course on making video documentaries. I know you two are really into videos. That documentary you made last term on homeless people was fantastic. And I've never thought this course before. I'm an old-fashioned film man, so I thought I'd get some suggestions from you on how to design this course. Well, I don't know if we can be much help, but we'll try. How exactly do you think we can help you? I suppose the first thing is... How much do most of the students know about video cameras? I don't want to waste time telling them stuff they already know. Actually, some of them have video cameras, but they only use them for home movies, that type of thing. Yeah, I don't think many of them know much about their cameras, just point and shoot. So maybe I should start with the basics of the video camera. I think so. Otherwise, they will just put the thing on automatic and lose out on a lot of really good things you can do if you control the camera more yourself. I agree. 
But do you expect everyone to have their own video camera? Too expensive for a lot of them, but they can rent them. Doesn't cost too much. Five to fifteen pounds a day, I think. Depends on the model. The thing I'm most interested in is getting them to plan their projects properly and be creative in their use of what they've got. Doesn't the film department have some cameras students can use? I checked that out. They've only got three. Probably not enough. Do you think they need broadcast quality cameras? You know, three CCDs, expensive stuff. As the conversation continues, please answer questions twenty-six to thirty. You now have some time to read questions twenty-six to thirty. No need. Single CCD. A bit of zoom. Wide angle for indoor stuff and scenery. Basic functions will do. You mean camera angles, shooting from interesting positions, creative lighting, that sort of thing. Kind of. But that's much the same as you teach in your film courses. Guess you're right. But I want to think of things you can do with a video camera that you can't do with a film camera. Aha! Secret shooting. Much easier to film people without their knowing with a tiny video camera than it is with a big film camera. Make a little hole in your pocket and off you go. And if you're not happy with something, you just erase it and do it again if you can. Good point, but there's a question of privacy here. Is it fair to film people without their knowing? Unless you're a cop or something, I suppose it's not. But it's often the only way to get what you want. I don't worry about these things. I just want to make good movies. Can't always do that if people know you're filming them. Well, I've never been taken to court for filming people without their knowing. But I agree. Sometimes you have to. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a British university lecturer in music talking about concerts in an arts festival. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. As you all know, the university is planning an arts festival for later this year, and here in the music department, we've planned three concerts. These will be public performances, and the program has just been finalised. The theme of the festival is links between the UK and Australia. And this is reflected in the music. Each concert will feature both British and Australian composers. I'll tell you briefly about the Australian music, as you probably won't be familiar with that. The first concert will include music by Liza Lim, who was born in Perth, Western Australia, in 1966. As a child. Lim originally learned to play the piano, like so many children, and also the violin. But when she was eleven, her teachers encouraged her to start composing. She found this was her real strength, and she studied and later taught composition, 
both in Australia and in other countries. As a composer, she has received commissions from numerous orchestras, other performers, and festivals in several countries. Liza Lim's compositions are vibrant and full of energy, and she often explores Asian and Australian Aboriginal cultural sources, including the native instrument the didgeridoo. This is featured in a work called The Compass. Her music is very expressive, so although it is complex, it has the power of connecting with audiences and performers alike. In the festival, we're going to give a semi-staged performance of the Oresteia. This is an opera in seven parts, based on the trilogy of ancient Greek tragedies by Aeschylus. Lim composed this when she was in her mid-twenties, and she also wrote the text, along with Barry Kosky. It's performed by six singers, a dancer, and an orchestra that as well as standard orchestral instruments, includes electric guitar and a traditional Turkish stringed instrument. Lim wrote that because the stories in the tragedies are not easy to tell. The sounds she creates are also disturbing, and they include breathing, sobbing, laughing, and whistling. The work lasts around 75 minutes, and the rest of the concert will consist of orchestral works by the British composers Rafe Vaughan Williams and Frederick Delius. Moving on now to our second concert. This will begin with instrumental music by British composers Benjamin Britten and Judith Weir. After the interval, we'll go to Australia for a piece by Ross Edwards. The Tower of Remoteness. According to Edwards, the inspiration for this piece came from nature when he was sitting alone in the dry bed of a creek, overshadowed by the leaves of palm trees, listening to the birds and insects. The Tower of Remoteness is scored for piano and clarinet. Edwards says he realized years after writing the piece that he had subconsciously modelled its opening phrase on a bird call. Ross Edwards was born in 1943 in Sydney, Australia, and studied at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music and the Universities of Adelaide and Sydney. He's well known in Australia, and in fact, he's one of the country's most performed composers. He's written a wide range of music, from symphonies and concertos to some composed specifically for children. Edwards's music has been described as being deeply connected to Australia, and it can be regarded as a celebration of the diversity of cultures that Australia can be proud of. The last of the three Australian composers to be represented in our festival is Carl Vine. Born in 1954, Vine, like Liza Lim, comes from Perth, Western Australia. He took up the cornet at the age of five, switching to the piano five years later. However, he went to university to study physics before changing to composition. After graduating, he moved to Sydney and worked as a freelance pianist and composer. Before long, he had become prominent in Australia as a composer for dance, and in fact has written 25 scores of that type. In our third concert, Vine will be represented by his music for the flag handover ceremony of the Olympics held in 1996. This seven-minute orchestral piece was of course heard by millions of people worldwide, and we'll hear it alongside works written by British composers Edward Elgar and, more recently, Thomas Adez.
That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Acing the IELTS reading section is all about time management. You only get 60 minutes to answer 40 questions based on three passages. Here are some tips to conquer the clock. Before you dive in, scheming is your friend. Don't get bogged down reading every word. Quickly scan each passage to grasp the main ideas and identify key vocabulary. Introduction and conclusion are gold means. These sections often reveal the author's purpose and main points. Pay close attention to them. Question time. Preview the questions. Take a quick look at all the questions for all passages before tackling the reading. This gives you a roadmap of what to look for while reading. Focus on keywords. Questions will often contain keywords from the passage. Highlight these to help you pinpoint relevant sections. Reading strategies. Don't get stuck. If you can't find an answer quickly, move on and come back later. There's no penalty for leaving questions unanswered. Estimated time per passage. Aim for 20 minutes per passage but be flexible. If you breeze through the first passage, allocate that extra time to the potentially trickier ones later. Extra tips. Practice under time conditions. Take practice tests under real-world time constraints to build your time management skills. Stay calm. Anxiety can eat into your time. Take a deep breath and focus on the task at hand. Answer all questions. There's no penalty for guessing. So take a shot at an answer for every question. By following these tips, You'll be well on your way to mastering time management in the IELTS reading section. Remember, practice makes perfect. So get out there and start honing your reading speed and comprehension skills.